Okay, well, it is 7.34 p.m. on Tuesday, May 23rd, 2023. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. Uh, first, I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Um, so from the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Uh, Daniel Riccadelli. Here. Uh, Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Adam LeBlanc. Here. And I did not see Venkat Holy. Has Venkat, are you with us? No. Okay. Uh, on behalf of the town, we have uh, Colleen Ralston, our zoning assistant. Good evening. Good evening. Um, and then is there anyone appearing on behalf of uh, 106 Varnum Street? I know Mr. Anessi was probably not available. Okay. Um, just briefly on 106 Varnum Street, uh, the applicant did submit a request to withdraw. So we will vote on that when it comes up. Um, but that we will. There, there, we will not be continuing further with the hearing on 106 Barnum Street. Um, appearing for 12 uh, Puritan Road, uh, Julie Gibson and Christopher uh, Scalzilli. There. Uh, appearing for 20 Martin Street, uh, Asha Sharman, uh, Sharma, excuse me, and Alvin Anthony. Yes, yes, we're here. Okay. And also, I'm Diane Miller. I'm the architect representing them. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank um, you. And then appearing on behalf of 48 Oakland Avenue, uh, Lindsay and Stephen Bronstein. Yes, we're here. Steve's just doing bedtime. Perfect. He'll be down directly. <laughs> no, no, no problem at all. Take your take your time. <laughs> and I, I'm I'm their architect and B. I'm Catherine McPhail. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you all. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects signed into law on March 29, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. And I will note that uh, the Department of Planning and Community Development did issue uh, memoranda on two of the sites, um, those being uh, 12 Puritan Road and 20 Martin Street, and those did not come out until about quarter of six today, so those were not posted, uh, but we'll, we, we will be displaying them during the course of the meeting. Uh, public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda, and as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. And as the board will be taking up new business this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotony, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants, 
who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So I will now move to item two on our agenda. Um, <clears throat> now moving on to an administrative item. This item relates to the operation of the board and as such will generally be conducted uh, without input from the general public. The board will not take up any new business on prior hearings, nor will there be introduction of any new information on matters previously brought before the board. Uh, so this uh, item is the vote to approve the written decision for 21 Oak Ledge Street. So this was a case that was heard by the board uh, at the end of April, and we have a great decision written by uh, Roger DuPont that was distributed for questions and comments, and a revised edition was issued at the end of last week for final comments. Are there any additional questions or comments in regards to 21 Oak Ledge? Seeing none, the board will, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the written decision for 21 Oak Ledge Street. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So moved. Thank you, sir. And a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this is a roll call vote of the board to approve the written decision for 21 Oak Ledge Street. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Uh, Mr. Hanlon. Aye. <clears throat> Ms. Hoffman. Aye. The chair votes aye. Mr. Holly, are you with us? Yes. Ah, wonderful. Uh, how do you vote on the decision? Aye. All right, thank you. Um, that brings us to item three on our agenda this evening. So before opening this here, the public hearings, here's some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicants to introduce themselves or themselves and make their presentations to the board. I will then request that the members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal and after the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. So with that, um, item number three on our agenda is docket 3745-106 Varnum Street. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Anesti, are you with us this evening? I do not see him. Um, so this was a an application requesting a special permit and a variance in order to construct uh, three-car parking lot uh, in the rear of a property at 106 Varnum Street. Um, the board had a, a prior hearing on this matter and the board voted to continue because there were some questions in regards to what the what the board was allowed to do and uh, what the applicant was, was allowed to request. Um, after consultation with the, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, inspector of buildings, uh, it was determined that the project would require a variance in order to uh, reduce the usable open space below the, the required minimum. And in addition, the uh, requesting an, an increase in the width of the driveway beyond 20 feet was found to also require a variance. So the, the applicant would have to have requested two variances on this property. And as they had stated previously, um, they understood clearly that they did not meet the criteria for a variance. And therefore, should they be required to have a variance, they were planning to withdraw. So they have done so, um, or at least requested to do so. Uh, it's up to the board to accept that withdrawal. So with that, do I have a motion to accept the withdrawal of all applications on 106 Varnum Street? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Uh, I'll move in a second, but one of the things they requested is that this be without prejudice. I assume that that's the intent of the motion. Uh, thank you. We can add that to the motion. Yeah. Okay, so moved. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon, and thank you, Mr. DuPont. So a vote of the board to accept the withdrawal of all applications on 106 Farnham Street without prejudice. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, <clears throat> Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That item is disposed. Brings us to item number four on our docket this evening, uh, on our agenda, docket number 3749, 12 Puritan Road. Um, so I would ask the applicants to please introduce themselves to the board and, um, and introduce their architect and tell us what they would like to do. 
Hello, I'm Julie Gibsons. My husband, Christopher Scalzilli, our architect, uh, Brad O'Donnell, is on, although it says Chris Scalzilli on the yeah. screen. Yeah, it says Chris on mine, but hi, I'm <laughs> Brad O'Donnell, their architect. Yeah, so um, just a few things. We live at 12, well, we did live at 12 Puritan Road. We're doing our own addition on 12 Puritan Road, uh, which is on a separate permit. And during the course of working with Brad over the last, I don't know, year or so, uh, my dad, who's 79, has had sort of increasing health problems. And during the course of working with Brad on our renovation and our plans, um, we ended up realizing that the town had passed um, or had supported this concept of an ADU and it just seemed to make so much sense for our family. Um, Dad's a vet, he's on a fixed income. He is 79 and in declining health. Uh, so, you know, we had no intentions of actually bringing him with us. And then, you know, as, as the process has gone, we've realized that this makes a ton of sense for our family to be able to help my dad and also for my dad to be able to age in place. <laughs> Um, so the reason we're here tonight is that um, in looking at sort of our lot, we figured, so during COVID, we had converted our garage into like a schoolhouse kind of rec space. Um, we have two young children and what have you. So during that time, we realized, or during working with our architect, Brad, we realized that if my dad were to come live with us, it might be a possibility to add on to our existing garage. So the way it's drawn up, um, it would be, I think, a little over 200 square feet. And the reason we're at the meeting tonight is because our garage is three feet from the lot line, and I believe the ADU requires six feet. Um, so in working with our design, I, I think as far as I know, all of our neighbors are on board. We've chatted with them. Um, we were mindful not to put windows on either um, the side sort of that would that's abutting our neighbor that would be the three foot side and in the back there would just be one small window uh that I don't think either of our rear neighbors would see so we try to be mindful in that design and you know be able to keep our big old tree in the back and what have you so we are hoping tonight that we could get permission to be able to um sort of reuse and uh, you know preserve what's already what we already have and just enhance it in a way that my dad could come live with us and uh, be able to age in place. So that's that. Um, do you have uh, a present uh, slides you'd like to show or should I bring up the application materials? Well, Kristen, you could bring up the application materials. I could also do a share screen if you like. That, um, that would be great. Um, Colleen, if you could, Enable the <clears throat> the Chris Scalzizzi. Uh, excuse me. All <laughs> set. Scalzilli. Gibson. Scalzilli. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, Brad. I think you are all set. Okay, I'll give it a I'll give it a go. Do you want to see the model, Christian, or do you want to do the? Uh, I'll start with the model. Oh. I need to allow it to share the screen, which is fine. Okay, is that doing it? All right, so this is basically what you see here in the uh, sort of dark green color is their existing garage. So it's existing, it's non-conforming, right? In the sense, as Julie said, it's three feet there from the property line. And what we'd like to do is add on 220 square feet here. And that turns it from a 300 square foot building into a 550, or sorry, 520 square foot building. Um, and again, as Julie said, the reason we're here basically is that this, as I understand, it would be a by right structure, except that it is not that six feet from the property line. So in lieu of tearing it down and starting over, it seemed like the better thing to do would be to save resources and just add on to what we have. So 
The part you see in the wood here, this is the addition. These are actually reused windows from their existing house. Then this is the existing facade, existing light, existing roof, um, and existing doors going in there. So there's actually no change going on there. There is a remodel, as Julie and Chris already said, that we're doing a remodel addition onto their house now. Uh, from the back, uh, I don't think anyone can actually see into this area, but we're adding one window here. And right where I'm doing this is an enormous tree that I don't actually have modeled. But um, so from the perspective of, you know, making this more non-conforming, it's not. We're not uh, increasing, you know, we're not getting any closer to any setbacks. We're going into a yard. We're well under the open space requirements. And um, I think all that information is on the plan or on the form. So that's basically it. It's a one story unit. We're not going up. We're just going out a little bit into the existing yard so that Julie's father can have a nice place to live. Um, in the inside, you can see it's just set up for one person. We're taking the existing area, making a living room out of it, a small one, a small bedroom, uh, and then a small kitchenette and bathroom. So it should be good for one person. And that one person is a member of the family. Wonderful. Thank you. Sure. Um, I, one quick question for you. Um, so I, I understand that the addition there is, so you're, there's an ongoing addition currently to the right. main house. Yeah. That is 748 square feet. And that is approved by right. Yes. Okay. So, and the, the numbers that I've put down for the areas and all that on the application include the new house. Okay. Right. So Was there any question raised by the building department as to whether or not the additional so the 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 additional 220 square feet that are being added onto the existing garage um would mean that the the amount of floor space that's being added to the lot is larger than 750 square feet and uh the board's going to look at the language because i i don't think it's an issue but i wanted to ask if the building department had raised any questions about <clears throat> the overall increase in square footage on the property. Um, I'll let Chris and Julie answer that since they're the ones who took it down there. Did they say anything to you guys about it? I'm just unmuting. Uh, no, I mean, our, our impression is that they're two totally separate things because this is an ADU and because the addition um, permit's been in for months and months. Um, yeah. Um, and then my only other question is, so on the roof form, which direction is the roof draining? Well, it's, so this is a pretty, what we're doing is it's, we're draining into a, obviously what is a butterfly roof here, and then we'll do a cricket, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, but is it moving towards the property line? We'll, we'll, we'll drain it to the front. Okay. So we'll do, a, we can do a cricket like that, or we can even cricket up higher up here, like that and pull the drainage you know, towards the front. That way we'll keep it from going into the, I mean, there is a good 10 feet to the back, mm -hmm. but um, actually we would do whatever you recommended. But I think the plan at this point- More is wanted to be clear that, that it was moving in one direction or the other. Okay. I mean, we've got the existing drainage coming off the roof here, mm -hmm. which is just going right down onto the, to the um, site. And then the, the existing garage, right. what is the construction? of the the wall the walls that are facing the two other sides right so it is type five you know it's it's wood frame there's no okay. fireproofing construction here okay. so this is a wood shingle and then underneath it's an older building so there's you know three quarter inch boards as the sheathing and then two by four studs Yeah, but so again, it's, it's at three feet. It's not under three feet. And I'm not sure if that's where you're going with this, but if you're talking about fireproofing. Right. So there's for in the, in the zoning bylaw under, mm -hmm. uh, there's a section on garages, uh, which is if it's set, if it's between zero and six feet, it has to be, it's a little, it's a little difficult to interpret, but um for a garage located entirely within the rear yard if right. it is within six feet it has to be at least type three 
Um, so I just wanted, but that's something that, um, you know, it's an existing condition. Right, it's an existing non-conforming. Non so, um, I mean, I was under the impression that was a three foot rule, but obviously you know better than I do because this might come up many times for you. No. Okay, are there... Um, and the area, you know, here, the area where we're adding, I think the screen is still being shared. The area where we're adding here is not, yeah. right? This is outside, the, you know, we're well inside the center. Right, on the, on the rear side, it's not, a, not an issue at all. Right. And yeah, I, I've got the okay. setback is this line here. So it's only here at the existing non-conforming condition and we're not making it worse. Right. Questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? Um, I wonder if you could look at, at the plan at this point and just sort of delineate where the usable open space is. So all of this is usable open space and all of this is usable open space. Okay, and the dimensions are, are and the picture of the, of the house is something that are, that essentially excludes the plan of where you're going with it, the, what's under construction. No, this includes the plan. So right, that's what, what I you're seeing on my screen now, the area I'm sort of moving the mouse around is the addition. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And you've easily got 20 feet, 25 feet in yeah. both of those places, right? That's right. Okay. Let me ask you one other question, Mr. Chairman, if I could. Please. When in, in calculating the size of the addition is th that was 748 square feet, as I recall. Mm -hmm. um, and did that include only the portion of the addition that was outside the building foundation? That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Other questions from the board? Mr. Chair. Mr. Riccadelli. I think I, um... You know, I have the same question about the the construction type. Um, I, I understand the the comments about you know this is an existing structure, but um, because it's now becoming part of a new use and we're adding on to the existing structure, I just wonder how you know the code would interpret that. Um, and I think it, it says type one and one and two are allowed if it's within that six foot setback, and then. Otherwise, it's type three. Um, so I, I just think that we should probably get to the bottom of that interpretation tonight. Okay. Are there other questions from the board? Um, so I know the, the board is in receipt of a, a letter from um, Member of the public who I know is in attendance tonight. So I think rather than uh, review that letter, we'll let him speak for himself. But I will go ahead um, and open the meeting for public comment. Uh, so public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments, and members of the public who wish to speak to digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application, and those calling in by phone can dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the chair. You'll be asked to give your name and address, and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Anyone wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, the chair will allow those wishing to speak for a first time to go first. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed or that we have reached uh, 8.30, um, the public comment period will be closed. Uh, and we will do our best to show the documents that people would like discussed. Um, so with that, are there any members of the public who wish to ask questions in regards to this application? Uh, we have a hand raised, uh, Don Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, or of a circle in Lincoln. I just have one question and as to whether there's been a stormwater mitigation plan filed in this, um, for this, 
development since the combined construction is more than 350 square feet. Um, thank you. So, um, so I'll ask the architect, do you know what the footprint, uh, it, so the Arlington requires that stormwater management be, uh, uh, the stormwater plan be reviewed by the town engineer if the impervious area is increased by 350 square feet or more. Um, and I know that the addition to the garage is 220 square feet. I wasn't sure what the square foot, what the footprint, footprint of the addition is on the house. Yeah, the footprint's 325, I believe. Okay. Okay. So that is one thing that we should, that the, um, the building inspector will be requiring uh, as a part of the application for the, um, for the addition on the garage. Okay, got it. Yeah, it does, yeah, it goes over that number if we're doing the garage as well. That's yeah. great. Thank you, Mr. Selsridge. Anything further? No, that's all I had to comment on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now looking, I see that the, the letter writer is not on the call anymore. Um, so there was, a, there was a question raised in a, a letter about the second driveway. Um, so the, the house currently has two driveways, as one to the, to the right that goes back to the garage. It has a second on the left. Um, and I was curious if you know anything about the history of having two driveways. We'll have a more question for the applicants. Hi. Hi. So <clears throat> when we bought this house maybe nine years ago, the, the driveways were there. Uh, okay. We were told by the owner that it was for emergency vehicles to be able to turn around oh. um, because it the street does dead end right after us. So that's what we were told. We, we did not put in the driveways. They were there when we bought it. Okay. Very good. I want to make sure we ask the question. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to address this application? I see none, so I will go ahead and close the <clears throat> public uh, comment period for this hearing. So what the, the board has before it, um, so it is a house um, on an existing lot. It has an, an addition that's under construction, but that is done by right. That's not under our purview for this hearing. Uh, what is before us is there's an existing garage towards the rear of the property, 10 feet off the back, six feet off the side. And the applicants are proposing a 220 square foot addition, um, which would maintain the 10 foot setback uh, from the rear lot line. And, the, and in addition, they're requesting that the um, uh, that the, the use of the garage be changed uh, from being a garage to being an accessory dwelling unit. Um, and so this is something that the board can do under uh, section 592B, uh, um, which is if the, if the accessory structure is within six feet of a lot line, creation of an accessory dwelling unit <clears throat> Um, the board has to find that the creation of the accessory dwelling unit would not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the use of such an accessory building as a private garage or other allowed use. And uh, the board uh, makes that determination in conjunction with um, the criteria for a special permit. Um, and I will quickly, I just wanted to share um, the memoranda on this property uh, that was submitted by the um, uh, Department of Planning and Community Development. So just give me a second, let me bring that up. That's the one that just came out? That's the one that just came out this afternoon. Okay, um, so this is the, the memorandum, um, which basically outlines the request. 
Um, so the, the overall proposal is between the two structures, um, but the dish that we are being asked to consider the 220 square feet that are going on to the existing accessory dwelling, uh, excuse me, the existing accessory building. Uh, the principal dwelling unit on the property is non-conforming with front yard requirements. The accessory building is located within six feet of the right, right side lot line. Um, so 592B and uh, an 813 is just that um, for an existing non-conforming structure, as long as you're not making it more detrimental, you can continue it. Um, and so the board may grant a special permit provided it finds the creation of the ADU is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the use of the accessory building as a private garage or other allowed use. Uh, proposed change reduces the overall usable open space. The applicant um, is not increasing the height of the existing structure. The proposal would not increase any of the existing nonconformities. Uh, so the following are the criteria. So requested use. The requested use is permitted through a special permit in the R1 zoning district since the existing accessory structure is located less than six feet from the property line. Uh, criteria number two for special permit, public convenience and welfare. The proposal would provide an accessory dwelling unit to create living space for an elderly family member. Criteria number three, undue traffic congestion or impairment to public safety. There would not be an increase in traffic congestion nor an impairment of public safety. Criteria number four, undue burden on municipal systems. There would not be an undue burden upon any municipal systems. Uh, criteria number five, uh, if granted a special permit, this proposal would meet the required conditions for ADUs under section 592B1 of the zoning bylaw. Um, the floor area is less than the maximum floor area requirement. Uh, due to its proposed size, it is not a large addition and therefore is not subject to 542B6. The accessory dwelling unit would have its own separate entrance. It would be the first accessory dwelling unit established on this property. Uh, ADUs are allowed in accessory buildings, in this case, subject to the granting of a special permit due to the existing setbacks for the accessory building. Accessory dwelling unit would not be used as a short-term rental, and the accessory dwelling unit is subject to state building code and state fire code. Um, criteria number six, the integrity and character of the district. Uh, while the accessory building is located less than six feet from the abutting properties, uh, the proposal to create an accessory dwelling unit is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing use as a garage or other allowed use. Single family homes are located in the immediate vicinity. Accessory building is located entirely behind the principal dwelling in the rear yard, approximately 20 feet from the nearest structure on an abutting property. Overall, this proposal would not detrimentally impact the neighborhood character of the district or adjoining districts, nor will it be detrimental to the health, morals, or welfare of the neighbors of the property. Um, and criteria number seven, detrimental excess of a particular use, it would not be a detrimental excess. Um, so this is just an image showing the location of the property. Uh, this is the existing house. The addition that's going up is on the far side. Um, and this is the garage you can see here in the rear yard. So the Department of Planning and Community Development maintains this proposal is consistent with the special permit criteria in section 333A through G. And the Department of Planning and Community Development recommends the Zoning Board of Appeals verify whether the applicant intends to construct an addition to the principal dwelling as shown on the submitted plans, uh, which we have already determined um, it is under construction. Mm -hmm. um, are there any questions on the memoranda from the Planning Department? None. Are there any further questions or comments from the board? Seeing Mr. None, Chairman, Mr. Hanlon. I wondered if the applicant, my understanding from what has happened so far, and I wonder if the applicant or his architect can do this, can confirm this, is that the building that we're talking about now that we keep on talking about as a garage is not currently being used as a garage. Is that true? It, 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 is it still being used as a sort of a education area or a play area, or is it being used at all? So during COVID, it was, we had a permit um, that we pulled and we turned it into sort of like an exercise classroom thing for our kids. And now that the kids are back in public school, it's just um, 
it's a finished space. It's already heated and cooled, and it's just a, like a yoga studio right now. Okay. So should the board vote um, to, to approve this application, um, the board has three standard conditions which it would apply to a special permit. Uh, the first is that the plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There shall be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Condition number two is the building inspector is hereby notified. He's to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time it is determined that violations are present. The building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts General Laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And condition number three is the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to this special permit grant. Are there any additional conditions which the board would want to include should the board vote in favor of this application? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I don't have finished text, but I think that it would be helpful under the circumstances to say that the applicant shall obtain approval of his own water <clears throat> management plan as required by and then cite the relevant provision of the bylaw. The purpose of this is simply to make sure that it's on paper that what we've already said and the applicant has agreed would be needed is uh, is not overlooked because it, it it would then be on the plans and people would be paying attention to it. Okay, um, so we do have a condition we have used in the past, which is the board requests that the applicant work with the town engineer to address compliance with the town stormwater management bylaw. Does that sound sufficient to you? That would that would be satisfactory to me. The only I'm just interested in having a clear warning so that it just doesn't get overlooked in the paperwork. Absolutely. Any further from the board, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hamlin. So like this isn't another condition. It's my being slow on the uptake. But there was one other question I had hoped to get an answer uh, from the applicant. And I wonder if with the chair's indulgence, I might ask that one. Please. Um, if, could, could you describe what's on the other side of the fence here? What what structures are how far away from the uh, from the uh, the property line, how close is this garage to actual structures or other <clears throat> uses in the uh, adjoining yard? Julie, do you want to take that? Sure. Yeah, I believe it's ten feet in one inch. Um, there is a wall behind the garage with uh, a fence on it, and then there's so there there's ten feet in one inch total behind our garage and our fence is you know maybe two feet before our garage so we left a good amount of buffer between the neighbor when we did that fence right and then that backs up to the neighbor's backyard so then it's another at least 20 feet to their structures oh, so yeah, yeah. 30 feet minimum along the back and then along that side where we're within you know we're within the six feet that backyard is completely open the whole way there's no structure i mean the next structure is an entire another property over on right. the uh, on the right hand side, the side that's actually non conforming now. It is. Thank you. Okay, so with that, um, the chair will entertain a motion. So, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, before moving, I think. The the discussion that we've had raises a question about the garage that was once a garage and that is no longer a garage. Um, and I just want the way in which I have come to look at it. The this is a prior non-conforming use, regardless. In other words, the provision about what could be done with garages, uh, de depending upon the type 
is really no longer relevant because it's not a garage. And the only thing that is relevant is uh, the article on ADUs, and that allows you to go within six feet by a special permit, notwithstanding that the building is not a garage. There's nothing in the ADU ordinance that requires that building, that independent building, to be a garage. It was no doubt thought of that that frequently would be the case, but that's not written into the statute. So we've got a prior non-conforming use one way or the other, uh, regardless of whether it's a garage or not, regardless of whether what would otherwise be applicable is six feet or 10 feet. So it seems to me that the issue, the obviously the issue that the provision on garages is aiming at is, uh, is public safety, that uh, if you're going to put a garage or any building that close to the property line, uh, there's a significant possibility that if it catches on fire, uh, <clears throat> that it will damage the properties on, uh, on adjacent uses, which presumably is the reason why it is that if you did have a garage, you'd have more leeway with one that is, uh, is built with uh, uh, more attention to be fireproofing uh, than if you didn't. Um, so where does that fit in? That Clearly, that's a relevant consideration, and it's something that we ought to think about. And since this is a special permit process, it seems to me that that generally fits in, I think, on the uh, in the area of, of the, the statute that uh, talks about uh, the character, the safe, and basically public safety and the character of the neighborhood. If we came to the conclusion, for example, that that garage was a fire trap, and uh, there were children's bedrooms immediately on the other side, um, we might be a little bit nervous about allowing a change of use uh, that would that uh, that would uh, increase the amount of usefulness of of this property. And the reason why I was interested in just what the other side of the property looked for was having some kind of a notion of what the actual condition today is, whether this is a, is is a uh, uh, is, is is a danger or whether it's not. Now, you know, somebody could come in and build on that other property and create a dangerous situation that doesn't exist today. Uh, and so then there's no guarantees about that. Uh, but on balance, given the given the condition of what's already there, where there's no individual danger, and the way in which the statute is structured, um, I feel reasonably comfortable saying that uh, even adding this criterion or this consideration to the planning department's analysis does wouldn't change the result. Uh, for me, I, it could in some cases, but in this case, it it doesn't, and I feel comfortable supporting a motion to approve uh, the application on that on that basis, among others. Mr. Chair, Mr. Gadelli, uh, I'd just like uh, to to add on to uh, what Pat said. I, I agree with with his assessment, um, and, and I think. I think the question I was thinking of in, in my mind was this is a change of use to the existing structure. Um, but for instance, if uh, this was an existing non-conforming house that was within a property line setback, uh, we would require that the new addition meet the, the code that is required in that location. So if it was a zero lot line condition, for instance, and we were extending that zero lot line condition, we would expect that that new portion of the building uh, be up to the current code, not requiring them to upgrade the, the existing portion of that building. So that's sort of the pathway um, that I was thinking about. I defer to the, you know, the board and everyone's comfort level. I, I think um, Mr. Hanlon's comments is well taken that this is not close to someone and I imagine it would not present a hazard but uh you know just as a matter of course if this was a much larger structure uh I think that that's that's the path that we would all take so I um I'm glad that it came up so we can sort of get a resolution and make sure everyone feels comfortable with that great thank you um so I think that would certainly be addressed by the building department as a part of their review. Um, 
because the the building the building code does address specifically things within zero to five feet, five to ten feet, and ten to twenty feet. So it would all be um, included as a part of the the permit application. But I I do agree. I think it's important that um, that it be raised as an as a as an issue and a concern, um, so that it can be we can make sure that we have indicated that we have addressed it. Um, are there with that, are there any further concerns? Oof. Otherwise, I would ask for a motion from the board. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So this time I'm going to actually move. Uh, I move that the application be approved subject to the three standard conditions and the additional consideration regarding stormwater management that has been read into the record. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this is a vote of the board to approve the special permit for 12 Puritan Road with the three standard conditions and the one additional condition. This will allow the use of the, um, excuse me, the accessory structure in the rear yard with its addition to be used as an accessory dwelling unit um, under the town's bylaws. So with that, I'll do a roll call vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. <clears throat> Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, the motion passes. Um, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and welcome. Members of the board. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Um, Brings us to item five on our agenda tonight, which is docket 3750, 20 <coughs> Martin Street. Um, so I'll ask the applicants to please introduce themselves and um, tell us what they are looking to do. Hi, uh, my name is Alvin Anthony, and, uh, and this is my wife, uh, Asha Sharma. We're here with our architect, uh, Diane, who uh, Diana, you there? Yeah, there yes, you are. I'm here. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. So uh, we we moved into uh, this property on Twenty Martin Street in uh, November of uh, uh, December of twenty one, um, and then this January we welcomed our first child. Um, uh, and you know uh, we have this is it's a, it's a typical Cape the house, um, but it sits on a on a property that's. Uh, that has a pretty steep slope um, uh, on on Martin Street. In fact, they didn't end up finishing up the the road um, uh, as to to get Martin Street to connect to Crawford Street uh, because of uh, how steep a ledge it is. And so there's a small walkway that uh, people use to 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 traverse uh, between Martin Street and Crawford Street. So the house sits on a ledge, um, and uh, we. we because of that, like I think we're uh, the basement that we have counts as a full story, and so you know most, although almost all of our neighbors have like a dormer on the first floor to extend, um, you know, the bedrooms out. Uh, looks, we we need a we need a variance to to be able to go there, um, and to be able to do exactly like what what the neighbors have. Uh, what we're hoping to get out of the extension is um, some additional like space that's you know that is not like the knee wall um on uh, on the that you typically find on a cape um and get some windows and some light in there because right now we only have like windows on the sides because of the way uh, the roof goes um i don't know diane if you have uh, anything else to add sure um i think that was a a great summary i wanted to just supplement that with some um uh numbers and square footages and that sort of level of information for the board um so we are seeking two things tonight. We're seeking a special permit um, per section 5.3.22 for the usable open space and also a variance um, as was mentioned for the story count. Um, with the usable open space there, uh, that special permit is because there are no areas with the minimum of 25 by 25 on the lot currently. Um, so nothing that is eligible for that calculation, which is also consistent with many homes in the area. We are not changing the footprint um, because we're just doing the dormer. Um, with the variance, it is, as was mentioned, a cape. Um, so it's currently designated as two and a half stories because of the basement counting as a story. With this dormer, this square footage would 
exceed the definition of the half story. So it would change from a two and a half to a three story. Um, what we are looking to do in terms of the area increase on the second floor is um, for the area that has a ceiling height of seven feet or greater, we would be increasing that by 173 square feet. So it's a fairly small increase, um, but that is enough to trigger the variance. The 173 square feet would make that second floor usable space at seven feet or greater go from 332 total to 505 square feet total. Um, their first floor is currently only 962 square feet. So that would put us at a total square footage first and second floor after the dormer, um, just under 1500. So it's still a very modestly sized home. Um, as Alvin mentioned, it is situated on a steep incline and also ledge. Um, so it does create that topographical hardship that meets the requirements as well as the ledge. So two of the hardships that meet the requirements for a variance. Um, with the um, basement counting as a story, as, I, as was mentioned, it is exposed on the back, but from the front, the basement is not visible at all. So you go like a six inch step from grade up into the house at the front. <clears throat> Um, the front facade of the house, as you see in the um, drawings, is actually very modest structure. It appears really as a single story home. There are no dormers um, on the front. And the height from the average grade to the ridge is 27.9. That's the current height, and that is what it would we would maintain that. And that number is well below the allowed height of 35. Um, so we're not increasing that. Uh, the dormer itself is well within the setbacks. Um, and it's actually 19.2 feet from the downhill neighbor, which is almost double what the 10 foot required setback would be in that direction. Um, I mentioned it doesn't change the footprint. We did also submit a petition that and a letter of support um, signed by 10 of the neighboring properties and that includes the media abutters. Um, so there are, as Alvin mentioned, several other homes in the neighborhood that have that are similar capes with dormers. Um, therefore, the proposed dormer is consistent with the scale, the massing, the character of the neighborhood. Uh, it meets the criteria for a variance. It is not substantially detrimental and it does not nullify the bylaw. Thank you very much. Um, go ahead and bring up the application. So this is the location here. Let's go to the hopes. Okay. Let me do this differently. I can share my screen if you want me to pull up the PDF so that it's oriented. If, yeah, if you wouldn't mind, that would be great. Okay. And I believe you have permission, so. Okay. Okay, here we go. So this is the existing elevations. I don't know, what is there a specific drawing that you'd like to look at? No, just, I, I think it would be helpful just to, to run through them all. Okay, great. Um, so there's the basement level on the first floor, not too much relevant there. Um, on the existing second floor, there are these two small bedrooms that are tucked in under the eaves. Right now, there's a bathroom in between. One thing that I did not mention is the stair leading up to this area is horribly treacherous. I mean, I was like holding on for dear life as I was climbing up there. Um, the winders, instead of three winders, there are six of them. So it's like this really, really steep thing. And as they mentioned, they have a new baby. Um, so <laughs> there's a little bit of urgency. We're going to be rebuilding the stair, hopefully before the baby is starting to walk um, so that it can be a little bit safer. But these are the exterior elevations as I had described. This is the front. So it's a very modest looking, looks like a single family, look, I'm sorry, looks like a single story home. The slope is pretty dramatic. So the grade is all the way up at the finished floor level at the front. And then it slopes down dramatically on the side. Um, and then across the back, this is the first floor windows. This is the basement level. And then this is currently one dormer. 
on the back that's in the bathroom area. And then what we are proposing is to make it a larger dormer so that both bedrooms can have windows on the backside. And so we can have the two bathrooms also with the head height that they need. Um, the This is a knee wall here that the beds are leaning up against. That's at like four and a half foot high. So you don't get to the full height until this line here. Um, there's some skylights. There's the proposed elevation. So the front doesn't change. On the back, the dormer is replaced with a bigger dormer right there. And then these are the new windows on that second floor. So just, to, I'm trying to, so currently there's a basement level, a first level and a partial second, is that correct? Or correct. is there one other floor in there? Nope, that's it. The basement, the first floor and the current um, second floor under the eaves that has a small dormer on the back. Okay. And so currently it's just under two and a half and the request is to be able to put a dormer on of sufficient size, but that would bring it over the two and a half percent threshold. That's correct. Correct. Okay. Um, and then so the and then the just if you could go um I don't know if you have them handy the uh, the variance criteria do you have that part of the same if not I can bring those up um I don't know that I have it handy okay I can go ahead and do that So um, as was indicated, there's a request for a special permit and for variance. So the, the special permit would be for um, the, essentially it's, it's an addition on the, in the attic floor, but it's entirely within the footprint of the house. And um, it's, it is considered a, the increasing the existing nonconformity with regard to usable open space, because currently that property has no usable open space, this would increase the amount of usable open space it's required to have and it doesn't have any. Um, so the, the zoning bylaws do include a provision that in addition, which falls entirely within the existing footprint is not considered um, uh, an extension of the existing uh, is, is not considered more detrimental essentially. So um, the special permit is not actually required. That can be approved by right. Uh, but what's really before us is this question of the variance for um, a structure which currently meets zoning in regards to the height of being less than two and a half stories and uh, the request to go beyond two and a half. Um, and the request is being made um, as a, a as it needs to be as a variance and variance is established under state law. It has four criteria that are required uh, to be and all four required to be met. And those are enumerated here. Um, so the first would be uh, described circumstances related to soil condition, shape or topography, especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it's located that would substantiate the granting of a variance. Um, and so they say that the land slopes 12 feet from the front of the house to the back, while the house actually appears to be a very modest one-story structure on the front. The slope creates a condition where the basement counts as a story, limiting the allowable scope on the actual second floor space. Despite the severe topography of the site, the house is still a low structure, only 27.9, existing and proposed from average grade plane to the ridge. Um, Criteria number two is how a literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning bylaw, specifically relating to circumstances affecting the land or structure noted above, would involve a substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the partitioner or appellant. Um, so the owners recently purchased this home and have welcomed their first child. They look forward to raising their family in the home and the community. Two bedrooms on the second floor have low ceilings and very limited functional space due to the steep slope of the ceiling. 
if they were unable to improve the functionality of those two existing bedrooms, they would not be able to stay in the house. Um, and then number three is how desirable relief may be granted without a substantial detriment to the public good. Uh, relief in this case will not be substantially detrimental to the public good because the house is so small and so low to begin with. The proposed dormer does not increase the height of the house and does not have any impact to the massing as perceived from the street. Most of the other homes in this neighborhood already have full second floors and many even have attic space above that. Proposed home will be consistent with the size, architectural style, and massing of the neighborhood. And number four, how desirable relief may be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaw of the town of Arlington. Uh, relief will not nullify or substantially derogate the bylaw because the proposed change only adds 173 square feet of new space for a proposed total of only 1,467 square feet with three bedrooms and maintains the existing 27.9 feet of height. The size house is consistent with, if not smaller than most of the other homes in the neighborhood. <clears throat> and then under state law, 40A section 10 requires zoning board of appeals must find that all four criteria are met in order to be authorized to grant a variance. If any one of the standards is not met, the board must deny the variance. Um, so the board is also in receipt of um, a memorandum from the uh, uh, Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, and this, I apologize, this came out very late today. Um, and so most people have not had an opportunity to see it, um, but hopefully, are you seeing it now? Yes. Or did it? Okay, perfect. Um, so it's a memorandum. Uh, the applicants seek a variance in accordance with, with 542, dimensional density requirements of the zoning bylaw. They propose to construct a 505 square foot dormer addition to a single family home for additional living space. The proposal would result in an increase in the square footage of 173 square feet. Lot coverage would not increase under the proposal. Structure is in the R1 zoning district and is non-conforming with the zoning bylaws, lot size, frontage, front yard, and usable open space requirements. The applicant is not increasing the footprint or height of the existing structure. For the definition of a half story, less than one half of the floor area measured from the underside of the roof framing to the finished floor below has a clear height of seven foot zero inches or more, where the floor area is measured relative to the gross floor area of the store next below, excluding porches and decks. Depending on the dimensions of the finished floor area of the third story, the proposal may create a new nonconformity. This addition would not increase any of the other nonconformities for the existing structure. And the following is an application of the variance criteria. Um, so in the opinion of the Department of Planning and Community Development, soil condition, shape, and topography of the lot do not limit opportunities for expansion in a manner that conforms with the current dimensional requirements. Uh, Hardship, although the slope of the lot limits opportunities for expansion into the side and rear yards, it is likely the proposal could be revised to comply with dimensional requirements. However, substantial modifications to the existing structure may be necessary, which could be cost prohibitive. Criteria number three, based on the definition of a half story, a 481 square foot dormer addition would be allowed by right. A 505 square foot dormer would be in character with the abutting homes. This property can accommodate the addition without compromising the public good. And criteria number four, the proposal is consistent with the intent of R1 zoning. Um, so this is the house here. Um, as you can see, this is the street, which ends um, at a substantial uh, rock outcropping um, in this area here. So this is the house itself, which is accessed off an abutting street. Um, this is the view of the house from the driveway. Is the Applicant said when you approach it from this side, um, it does appear to be just a single story house. Um, so the Department of Planning and Community Development maintains this proposal does not meet criteria number one, and they're unclear if it meets criteria number two. Um, that, is, that is the opinion of the Department of Planning and Community Development, but it's up to the board to reach its own conclusions. Um, so with that, I would ask if there are questions or comments from the board. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So how big a, 
how suppose the applicant were to build out to the to, as far as they can do within the two and a half stories how big and right now we're talking about 505 square feet how much less than that would would be compliant with the zoning ordinance so the department of planning and community development said that based on the definition of a half story that a 481 square foot addition would be allowed by right so what i'd like is an explanation of suppose we said you know that's a pretty good addition it's not ideal uh, but it's not going to but it, it's not so bad uh, what would be the answer to that i mean obviously you'd rather have it something a little bit more uh, but we're dealing with with severe hardship here, and I think that the underlying rationale of the planning department's decision is that you could comply, you could expand, and you could comply. You just can't comply uh, the difference between 505 and uh, and 481. So I, I wonder if the applicant could address that and and explain why it is that the smaller addition would be a hardship or or possibly not not possible at all and can we just first clarify how the um how they came up with the 481 square foot number i think that they took the area of the first floor uh okay. which was 962 and divided by two divided that by two okay So um, I, I think that it's worth noting that the difference we're talking about here is like 25 square feet. So it's not a significant amount. Um, I think mm -hmm. what we look at with the design of this was initially we, we thought about, okay, do we attempt to make it into a colonial, more of a traditional colonial home so that we could really get maybe even a third bedroom up there, just get a little bit more usable space. Um, but we didn't want to uh, ask for too much. And we also didn't want to make it a three and a half story with the attic space. So we wanted to keep our height at the um, dimensional height that it was at. Um, so that's where we started to look at a dormer instead. Um, and we felt like the 25 extra square feet really gave them the functionality. They really wanted to have two separate bedrooms so that, I mean, just, I'm sorry, two separate bathrooms so that they would have a hall bath and a master bath and that that becomes, and to have windows in both of the rooms um, facing that backside and that became limited. And so I think it does actually, even though 25 square feet is sort of a de minimis um, number, it does make an impact in terms of how they can use the second floor of their home. And 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 I think the, uh, you know, from from what I we've talked to some, you know, from from a contractor standpoint as well, and like what we're what we're proposing here is a is a pretty standard addition, and it just happens to cross that like that threshold, and it's like the minimum we need, but yet like having a, a standard structure that's a the, the full dormant that's kind of what it nets out at. Uh, you know, I wish it didn't, right? Like we didn't have to go through this process, but it's just a, a, a small amount that just like and, and we want to do, do the right thing for the, the house itself uh, as well because just doing the dormer all the way from a cost standpoint that just makes more sense um, than limiting it to meet like that specific number i wonder if you could expand on what the cost effect would be uh, that that's re referred to in the planning department memorandum as well uh what what I mean, would okay, be required so, to actually meet the requirements of the bylaw. Yeah, I, I can't say I can I can speak to that. I'm just speaking about like what uh, from just having spoken to a few contractors, like what they mentioned about you know like having a very selective dormer versus like the whole dormer. They're like it's not. It's actually just makes more like financial sense to just dormer the whole way. That's what I meant. I I don't actually know like relative to we didn't quote it out like. <clears throat> 
So I think, yeah. are you, Alvin, are you also thinking like a cost per square foot? Like it, there's a certain cost associated with dormering mm -hmm. and the more square feet you get out of that, the more um, it makes sense from a cost per square foot in terms of the value that you're getting out of it. Um, yeah. But the other piece that I wanted to um, respond to, if I may, Mr. Chairman, is the um, criteria one, um, mm -hmm. which I, I'm, I'm surprised that the review did not find it to be substantial because it is a substantially sloped. I mean, you cannot even walk down the side of their yard. For me to get the pictures and measurements from the back, I had to go like around and down and come at it from a different angle. So, I mean, it is such a severe slope. And I know that in Arlington, there are other properties that have slopes. But I feel like this particular property is one of the steeper ones that I've been on. And there are many around of their immediate neighbors where it's like it levels off that whole driveway access is level. And then there's just where the house is just kind of plummets. And I also feel like they are up against the setbacks in terms of the rear and both side setbacks. And so the only other way that they could possibly expand their house, which is a very small house, to begin with, the only other way that they could expand it if it were not by doing a, a second floor expansion would be to bump the house forward into the front setback, into the front yard, um, which I don't think makes a lot of sense. So in terms of hardship, that is really not where you want to put, it's not enough room. It's, you know, it's only at nine feet that they could come forward. It's not enough room to put bedrooms. It's not enough. It's not a logical place to put that. So there aren't really any other options in terms of how they could expand on that property. Um, so I I was somewhat surprised by that mm -hmm. assessment. I, I do feel like this is a, um, a significant variance hardship with the topography being pretty extreme. Um, so the, the dormer itself is inset one foot nine from each end of the, um, the floor below. Do you know how much it would need to be brought in in order to be compliant? to gain back those those 25 square feet, feet. um yeah. i don't off the top of my head uh, but let's look at it i'm not sure the so i would probably probably about five Feet, like another two feet on each side, two and a half feet on each side, something like that. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Um, so just thinking about uh, how you opened um, this hearing, about the um, usable open space. If if the applicant were to um, inset those dormers that two feet or, uh, to get that additional 25 square feet of head height away, would this project be by right? Um, so what did I say the length of the dormer was? Um, back to that. So the length of the dormer is 28 foot 10. So if the front wall of the dormer was brought in probably 10 inches, it would be compliant. Or if the sides were brought in by, by as, the, as the architect said, about two and a half feet per side. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Just translating it in. If if we think that they don't need a special permit because they're within the foundation uh, uh, foundation, um, and if it were to, if they were able to change this so that they would also not be going beyond the two and a half stories, then it seems to me it has to be by right, doesn't it? I mean, you don't need much arithmetic to for that, or am I missing something? What what question would what question would remain to us if they actually met the two and a half story requirement? 
if they met the two and a half story requirement, they would not be before us. And that's the 25 feet. And that's the 24 feet, yeah. See, it seems to me that what's going on here, the planning department's viewpoint is they're starting with the notion is, can you get to the 24, the 24 feet? Mm -hmm. And they think you can. They think that the, the slope doesn't prevent you from getting to the 24 feet. And they also think that getting to the, that the 24 feet wouldn't possibly wouldn't have imposed a big hardship. And so that gets them past one and two. You can approach it from a different point of view. You can say, well, could people do what you normally do here? I mean, the neighbors don't have to worry about that 25 feet. Why do these, why does the applicant have to worry about the 25 feet? Well, it's because the steep slope, it makes it impossible for them to do this because their basement counts. And you go at it in a different way, you come out a different result. But it's largely, it's a trick of perspective, but it's one that's important to us because we have to figure out which is the viewpoint really that we're obligated to apply if we're going to faithfully apply the, uh, the state criteria. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So I, I think that when I was looking at this before the meeting, I did also focus in on that 24 or the 25 square feet. And I would just say to the applicant that these are really always tough. There are some variance requests which are very obvious uh, just because they might have a very oddly shaped lot. And in order to do something, you'd have to be closer to the lot line and those sorts of things. So there are some variance requests which are actually fairly straightforward. For me, when I was driving over there, first of all, I couldn't find the property when I drove down Martin Street and had to circle around because and then I figured out what was going on there. Um, but for me, you know, you look at it and you say, okay, well, it has to be conditions affecting your specific lot that don't apply. Um, to the rest of the district, meaning basically the neighborhood. And I know within the board, we've had disagreements about how that should be applied. And so, you know, when I was driving around in the circle, you know, on to Charles and whatever the other adjoining streets are, it's clear to me that that's a whole bunch of hill in that area. And there's a whole bunch of ledge. And I could not at all determine or distinguish between you know your lot and other lots in terms of what conditions are unique to your lot and which are not. And I think that to some extent that may be what drives the recommendation, not that we have to follow it from the planning department, but I tend to look at it in sort of the same view they do, which is it's not clear to me that there is a clear connection between slope, which is just a condition which is unique to your property and not to other properties in the area and the inability to conform to the requirements of the bylaw, which is that 25 square feet that we're talking about without undue hardship. So I do have a problem processing this as a variance. I'm just letting you know. And, and so that's, that's my particular uh, issue, but it, it sort of echoes, I think what the, uh, planning department said uh, in their analysis as well. Um, I have a question. Is there anything about the slope which makes the basement difficult to occupy? I see that there appears to be an office down there, um, and obviously there's mechanical spaces, but uh, is there, like, is part of it, of, is there a ledge that's in the basement itself, or um, is there some reason is there something about the basement that makes it difficult to inhabit? No. Okay. Because certainly this is, a, you know, in this house, because the so much of the basement's exposed, it actually is more, to my eyes, more, you know, the, the basement could be used to a much greater extent because you can put, you know, regular windows in the basement um, and be, you know, have a full exposure. So um, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, are there other questions from the board before I open it for public comment? Um, I did want to acknowledge that, uh, as the applicant had said, they did um, uh, go around and discuss with their their project with their neighbors, um, and they do have signatures of 
of 10 of their neighbors um, in favor of the application. Um, and there was a letter, <clears throat> excuse me, that was um, submitted by uh, their neighbor at 48 Crawford Street, um, also speaking in favor of the addition. Um, so with that, um, we'll go ahead and open this public hearing for public comment. Um, questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand. It should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing the decision. Uh, if you'd like to speak, you may raise your hand digitally by using the button on, I keep saying participant tab, but Zoom moved it. It's now on the reactions tab. Sorry about that. Um, and if you're calling in, you may dial star nine. Um, and any, we will, the uh, board will take uh, questions and comments until all have been addressed or uh, we have reached, uh, let's say, 920. Um, so with that, it is open. Um, so Mr. Anthony, you don't have to raise your hand as a, as a uh, member of the public being the applicant, but uh, please go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, respond to the to the comment of the uh, about uh, you know using the basement uh, and, and oh, please. making that livable space. Like we did, we did consider that. Um, like one of the things, one thing that we want, what I want my uh, what my wife wants is like we want a bedroom that has like you know windows on on two sides of the room for for some amount of cross ventilation. We cannot like have, and we also want to have like our child sleep on the same floor as us, right? So we basically are looking for uh, a situation where, you know, she can grow up, have her own bathroom, and like we can have two separate bedrooms on the on the same floor with both bedrooms having like, you know, more than one uh, window for, for, for light and air. And like the basement doesn't allow for that configuration uh, because like on the one side, you know, obviously we're we're blocked uh, because it's below ground. And on on you know on one side on one side of the basement we could get two windows. In fact, we have them. But on the other side, like we have no windows. We could get one, uh, right? But it wouldn't actually like allow for for two bedrooms on the same level that we can share with our daughter. Uh, and so like up we can only go up. Uh, in fact, it would be cheaper to actually like make uh, Diane and I like we, we we discussed that as the first option. So we decided to go up simply because there wasn't like a way for us to build it out in the basement. And and to the comment about you know what's different about us and and the neighbors, it is exactly the fact that we have you know we happen to have like you know one side of our basement like that's above ground which like you know our neighbors don't have that problem right like that is unique to us um because of of our situation so uh because of the ledge so like you know that's yes it's hard to distinguish our property from from the neighbors uh and from the area um but you know we do have if if this if the grade were you know slightly off by like a few inches right like this count as two and a half stories and uh, I mean it would you know it wouldn't count as a full story and we would be totally okay so it's really just the grade uh, and you know the slope and the way it's set up that puts us at a disadvantage with respect to our neighbors right and it's not that we can therefore use that to our advantage even to like have two full bedrooms in the basement and uh, and and make it work like that in fact I would much have preferred that it's just that it wouldn't be uh, you know, a viable bedroom uh, on on one side of the basement. So going up was our was not our first choice. It, it's uh, it's it's something that we've been uh, you know we we didn't actually uh, yeah it's just something we landed on by eliminating other options. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Are there members of the public who wish to address this hearing? If so, please raise your hand using the button on the reactions tab or. Wave in, wave in your window so we can see that you're there. Do not see any. I will go ahead and close public comment for this hearing. Um, so what the board has before it, this is an application for a variance um, for 20 Martin Street. Um, this has been explained. Uh, this is a house where the, the lowest floor um, is about half in and half out of a very sloped site. Um, the, what's effectively the second floor 
is really their first floor that is free and clear of the ground. Um, and then the attic above, they are looking to add a, uh, a shed dormer uh, on the east side, which would grant them the space they need to have um, a master bedroom, a master bath, a hallway bathroom, and a second bedroom um, on that floor. Um, and that adds up to 505 square feet, which is 24 square feet above the maximum threshold for a half story uh, for this property. And so they are requesting uh, relief from the board by the granting of a variance uh, in order to, to um, have that additional space. And um, so that is the question before the board. And it, as was pre previously read in, um, there are four criteria that need to be met in order to um, qualify for variance under uh, Chapter 40A, Section 10 under state law. And so um, it is up to the board to determine whether uh, those criteria are met. And if so, then grant the variance. But if the board determines that those criteria are not met, not met the board is not allowed to issue a variance. Um, so with Mr. that, Chairman. Go, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I wonder if the, the chair has done such an outstanding job so far of summarizing this as he does so many other cases. I wonder if you could just sort of state in from your point of view, particularly as an architect, what would be the harm, what would be the hardship uh, that should move us if we were to say that the applicant has obviously some extra difficulties other people don't have because of the location of their property, but that by itself is not a reason to get a variance but they could, by bringing the dormer in a little bit, me essentially not have that 24 feet, that uh, not violate the bylaw. What's, what is the hardship that comes from actually complying? That seems to mm -hmm. me to be the key issue here is what is not what, why you can't do everything you want, but what is the hardship that comes from not complying as opposed to sacrificing that 24 feet? Certainly. Um, so the the language under Section 10, um, so the Board of Appeals must specifically find for a particular piece of land that, quote, owing to circumstances relating to the soil conditions, shape, or topography of such land or structures, and especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it's located, a literal enforcement of the provisions of the bylaw would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the partitioner. And that desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of such ordinance or bylaw. So the, there's a lot of case law about what is a substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the petitioner. Um, So I, what to my mind, what would constitute a substantial hardship would be that, um, you know, they would not be able to occupy, um, they would not be able to have two bedrooms um, in that house. Um, that would be a substantial hardship. They wouldn't be able to, um, use the house in a manner uh, that one would expect to use a house. Um, a lot of the things around the financial, you know, yes, it may be more expensive to do things one way or another, but we're not talking about, you know, requiring, you know, on a, on another site, like you might consider, um, you know, there's a substantial piece of ledge that you have to move in order to comply with the zoning bylaw. The board has seen that recently that um, there was a case last year, I believe, where um, in order to use the use the part of the site that was within the setbacks would require removal of a substantial amount of land, whereas a portion of the property that was within the setback was ready and able to be used. Um, so to my mind, those are sort of the substantial hardships. Um, I, the the question that I had asked about whether 
you know, the dormer could be made narrower. And, and a lot of houses in Arlington, the dormer is not, um, you know, does, does not extend the full length of the, the side. It is actually substantially smaller in order to meet that criteria. Um, and I, I think what Mr. Riccadelli brought up about, you know, you could move the front wall of the dormer in slightly, and that would gain you, you know, that would reduce the, the square footage by 24 feet pretty readily because the front wall length is 28 feet. So you don't even have to move it in a foot. Um, oh, may I, may I comment? I'm sorry. Yes, please. Ms. Miller. The only issue with moving the front wall of the dormer in is that the, both of those bathrooms are really tight. The hallway is tight. So we would not be able to have, um, like the, the bathrooms have a minimum size sink and toilet and tub configuration. So to take 10 inches out of the bathrooms would be significant in terms of that layout. Okay. Mr. I'm Chairman. Sorry to have you're interrupted. Pinned, because you're pinned in between the top tread of the stair and yeah. the bathroom wall, essentially. Yeah. Okay. So Mr. Mr. Chairman, this is where, I mean, I, actually in some ways I'm focusing more on what it means to be talking about a literal enforcement of the bylaw uh, than the hardship. And I think what Ms. Miller uh, just raised is the kind of thing I'm thinking about. It's it, if you comply by pulling everything in or by making it shorter, if you do whatever you do to get that 24 feet, what is the harm that flows specifically from that? And Ms. Miller has indicated indicated one, uh, and we we have to judge whether all of those things amount to a hardship. But the real question to start with is whether they are occasioned by a literal appliance uh, application of the bylaw. And the first aspect of a literal application of the bylaw would be just to comply and have something that is only a, a half story at, at the top. So I do appreciate uh, both your summary and Ms. Miller's addendum. Other comments from the board? Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Holly. Yeah, um, at, at looking at the average grade calculation, sir, not that I want to go into details. There is a note saying the seller, is, is this definition of a seller or a or, or basement? The other question is, I think they took the four points, and again, I have to go back and look at the definition but there, but the four corners of the building and then averaged out the grade because of the slope with which this, the the large slopes does it does the average grade calculation vary um, there? Just trying to see if um, if that puts the ceiling height to somewhere close enough. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, so current so the the bylaw requires that um, if more than I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna I'm gonna read it rather than. Uh, I know, I was trying to save myself on that. <laughs> um, so Arlington differentiates between a cellar and a basement. Um, they are very similar. But a, so a cellar is a portion of a building partly or entirely below grade, which has more than one half of its height measured from finished floor to finished ceiling below the average finished grade of the ground. And the basement is essentially the opposite. So it has um, less than half of its height below the average finished grade. So, so if, in this, I'm case, just looking at the numbers. So here, the basement floor is at 103 and a half. The basement ceiling is at a 113, and average grade is at 106.4. Five. So, so five three feet, feet above the floor <clears throat> and effectively seven feet below the ceiling. So it's very much a basement. Right, 7.11, yeah. And then in order for it to count as a story, the average grade to the ceiling has to be at least four foot six, and it is well over that. So seven, it right. does definitely count as a story. But the average grade 
would not be changing because of the slope of the lot. It's just the four corners of the building. Um, did I get that? Is it just that is, for the? That's, yeah. So the it's the yes yeah, the average of the height, you know, going around the building. I don't know if it's specifically taken from the core four corners or if it's done more granular, but that's the that's how that is calculated. Okay. It's where the land meets the. Right. Right. <laughs> Any further questions from the board? If not, the way the board typically has considered these in the past is we take a look, we go through it criteria by criteria for a variance, um, then sort of discuss what our what we feel is the is the um, whether the criteria is whether the criteria for those are met. So I'm going to go ahead. Push this back open. We'll go ahead and share this again. So under state law, variance can be granted when all four of the following are met. Uh, describe the circumstances, soil condition, shape, or topography, especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it's located that would substantiate the granting of a variance. Um, so as is noted, the land slopes 12 feet from the front of the house to the back of the house. And while the house appears to be a very modest one-story structure from the front, the slope creates a condition where the basement counts as a story, limiting the allowable scope on the actual second floor space. Despite the severe topography on the site, the house is still a low structure, only 27.9 existing proposed from the average grade to the ridge. Um, so within this let me take the site plan. So this is a fairly rectangular lot. So there's nothing about the shape of the lot, the rectangular house, square on the lot. There's nothing about the shape of the house. Um, but what you don't see here is, you know, it's this topography question. Um, Course, I picked the ones where they're the house is sideways. I apologize. Um, but you can see that there's a significant grade change over the, the width of the house. The question then is is this grade change across the house, which exposes the basement and makes the basement a story, where in most houses in Arlington that would not be the case. Um, does this is this especially affecting such a land or structure, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it's located? Um, I mean, obviously, this is located on a very hilly portion of Arlington. Um, it is located on a paper street because of the the severe grade change that's happening around the house, um, and the. It wasn't addressed, but I would imagine there's a fair amount of ledge supporting the, the house in its current position, um, which may make it difficult to, um, to utilize other portions of the lot. Um, but there are also a lot of other steep, steep sites um, in this area. So kind of curious to hear from other members of the board sort of what their, what their impression is, whether they feel that you know, there is something unique about this lot um, and its topography because it's not the soil condition and it's not the shape, it's really the topography. Um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, so I, I've gone back and forth and may yet go back and forth. But on this one, it seems to me that the question before us is not whether steep slopes are common or not common in this area, but whether they are clearly common and they were common in the Mount Gilboa area. And we've given a number of variances there as well. The issue is sort of what is the implication of the steep slope for this particular property? 
uh, and not just generally a question of, of topography. And it seems to me that the nature of the problem that the applicants have flow from a way in which the topography affects their property that is not generally affecting the property of their neighbors. As the testimony has been, the neighbors ha have generally found it pretty easy to do the things that the applicant wants to do. Uh, the topography is having an implication, uh, having an effect on their property uh, that isn't generally true. Uh, and so I would I would say that that the first condition is met if the second condition uh, is met, which we'll get to in a minute. I would say one thing about precedent is that in the western part of Arlington, uh, there's a lot of challenging topography, and sometimes it rises to the level of hardship, and sometimes it doesn't. But if we really took a, if we really treated this just as a matter of of so a uh, physical science, uh, we might be excluding a great part of the town from the relief that the variance provisions provide uh, in a way that that may not either be required by the statute or wise for us to do. So I would be I would hate to sort of rely on the fact that there's hills all around uh, with respect to this, I, I am still interested in whether a little literal application of the bylaw causes severe hardship, but we'll get to that next. But I'd give this a pass on the first criterion. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Other members of the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So I too have some difficulties and do tend to go back and forth as well. But when I read the uh, materials that had been submitted, I was focusing on the fact that the argument was being made that because, and I may be wrong about this, and I'm happy to be corrected, but I sensed that what was being argued that was that because there was a slope, then it was uh, there was a basement uh, created as opposed to a cellar. So a cellar wouldn't be a story. A basement would be a story. So I thought that I was reading an argument to the effect that because there's a slope, this then makes this uh, basement, this space below a story. And therefore, that's how we get to argue that we should be able to then go up uh, upon the roof for this dormer in excess of what the uh, require the uh, bylaw would provide, and again, we're only talking about twenty five square feet, and and so I look at it and I say, well, the fact that there is a story there, even if it is created by the slope, doesn't get me to a point where I say, yes, you know, this uh, this property is affected uh, by the topography in a way that makes it. Um, hard and uniquely hard to comply with the bylaw. I just have not been able to make that leap. And it's especially true for me, I'll admit, when I think we're talking about the 25 square feet. And I did understand the argument that was made by Ms. Miller. And you know, that was that was a good comment that was made about why that would create a problem. But I don't get it uh, quite honestly why where the argument is being made that because there's a slope, there's a story, and but for, you know, that slope, we wouldn't have a story below, and therefore we would be okay with whatever we wanted to do because it wouldn't be a third floor we'd be creating; it would just be a second floor. Perhaps I'm not being that clear, but that's how I've been thinking about this, and I'm I'm struggling to get beyond that first criteria, and I I tend to think that there is a problem with that. Mr. Chair, Mr. Holly, I I do agree with Ms. Mr. Dupont there because um to me some sometimes a door coming out of a basement is actually a welcome. It's not a hindrance in the sense the grade helps to have a door that you have a walkout basements. So it's not a it's not a, a criteria which is a, you know a hindrance. Um, so that that should dictate that because we're not able to do it as a story, we have elsewhere to do it. You know, uh, it is a leap to me as well. I, I feel it that way. 
can I can I respond to that, uh, Mr. Chairman? Just uh, Mr. Anthony, yes. Okay, so uh, just uh, you know, want to clarify. Yes, there's a door coming out of the basement, uh, but you know, to me, as uh, you know, I, I don't know a whole lot. I'm not uh, you know a construction person, but when I say story, like I expect the whole story, the whole level to have equal access, right? Like, yes, we have a door coming out of one side, right? But like. I've, we've lived here a year, a year and a half. We've opened that door like, you know, three times. It, it doesn't like actually like lead to anything useful. The side is like, so it's such a slope that you can't actually like walk. Like I, I wouldn't like trust a, a kid there, um, right? To like walk down that slope. It's just completely unusable, right? So there is a door that is true. I'm in fact, I'm looking at it, but like I can count on my, on one hand, the number of times we've opened it to access anything outside. The second is that on the other side, right? Like I'm sitting in the basement right now, right? Like on the other side, there are no windows, right? And there is like, at best we can get, uh, you know, like uh, one, like a window on one side, right? Like the, the door that you see on the other side actually is to a shed, um, right? Like, so it, it there's no light coming from, you know, three sides of, of the other side. So the even though it is a story, by the way, you know, you're defining it based on on ceiling height, it's actually not usable as like a living, a livable like bedroom, right? Like it's, 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 we use it for storage and, and for laundry, but like this part of the house, yes, like there's light, uh, but you know, the door is not really usable. Um, and like, you know, and then the whole level is not like the two sides of the house, like don't actually give us the same amount of light and space. So even though it's a story, it's, it's only like a half and like, like I said, for our purposes, we just want like, you know, a bedroom on, we want some level, a story that has, that can accommodate two, two like bedrooms and bathrooms so that, you know, my wife and I, and like our baby can have like our, our own space and yet be on the, on the same floor. Um, and, and that's to me, like the definition uh, of the ask. And I'll also say that like the family that like sold this to us, they had twins and they basically had the same problem that we're now having when we had our baby and we didn't have a baby when when we bought the house so we didn't think too deeply about this right like they had babies and they were like you know we can't hand they they, they moved out uh for you know they definitely didn't mean to move out either like this house has been super well maintained uh but you know so we'll be in the same place if if, if this is denied just as as like as it says uh, in in the description there Thank you. Mr. Holly, did you have anything further? No, I um I understand all the concerns voiced for sure, but um just purely by going by the definitions and, and what the bylaw says, which we have to adhere to or at least yeah um interpret with is what we're getting at. Um so um, that's all to add. Thank you. Um, any comments from other members of the board? Yeah, I definitely agree. This is the sort of the, the, the crux of the question. Um, and there's definitely a couple different ways to look at it. Um, you know, it's Mr. As Mr. Hanlon pointed out, um, go back to my notes. Um, it's sort of the implication that of, of what the what impact what the impact is uh, from the topography, um, you know, and that you know this this there is challenging topography here. It's easy to say there's challenging topography in a lot of places because there really is, but you know what we really need to focus in on is you know, what, is there something about the, the topography here that's causing a hardship? Um, and, is, and is it unique to this property? And it, it sort of comes down to this question of um, the, the way that, the way that it converts that, what would otherwise be um, the lower level that that's, doesn't count towards the height because it's not really useful. Um, while it doesn't really affect the usefulness of the floor, it does now all of a sudden count against them. Um, and that was sort of part of what uh, 
you know, with the, the comments by Mr. DuPont that um, that the, the topography does make you know, makes that issue, but is that does it rise to the level that it is um, something that um, is especially affecting land or structures here, but not generally affecting the zoning district um, in which is located. And as Mr. Holly said, it's sort of, you know, he's sort of is a little more similar to Mr. DuPont. Um, you know, I'm sort of wrestling with this, uh, the same as every, everyone else. Um, I, you know, I, I, the board's going to have to vote on this in a sec. Um, so everyone should sort of consider sort of where they stand on this. Um, for myself, I am. I, I feel that this that this site is sufficiently different from the other kinds of slope issues that we generally deal with in town. Um, that I think we, me personally, I I I can make the fun. I, I'm comfortable with the finding that it does, um, that we can claim it meets the first criteria, um, and then we would move on to the to the second criteria. Um, but you know, obviously, everyone should reach their own conclusions on on where they stand on this. Um, so, I, probably the best way to do this is we should take probably take a vote on the first criteria and see where we stand. And then from there, we can um, go forward to the other criteria. Um, and I, because this is sort of relating directly into the decision, I, I think we're going to have to limit the vote to uh, to just the, the, fi the five standing members um, of the board. So on criteria one for a variance, Um, do just a quick vote of a roll call vote. Um, so, Mr. Dupont, I would say no. Okay, uh, Mr. Hanlon, I would say yes. Okay, uh, Mr. Holly, no. Uh, Mr. Riccadelli, no. And the chair would say yes uh but the no's have it um so the board does not feel that the first criteria has been met um and so with that um because it needs to be a it needs to be a vote of four of the five in favor and it is only a vote of two of five in favor um so the board would need to deny the variance um, for this property um, with that um, I would move uh, that the board um, deny the variance for 20 Martin Street um, so the there's a motion by the chair may I have a second second I uh, thank you. Is that Mr. Hanlon? Yep. Thank you, sir. Um, so this is a vote of the board to deny variance for 20 Martin Street. Um, vote forward by the chair and seconded by Mr. Hanlon, the roll call vote of the members. Uh, so a positive vote is in favor of a denial. Uh, so Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Um, so with regrets to the uh, to the applicant, uh, the board has to deny the variance for 20 Martin Street. We thank you for your time and for coming before us this evening. And thank you. I, we do appreciate uh, all of your careful thought and deliberation on it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, with that, we go back to our agenda this evening, brings us to item six on our agenda, docket number 3751, just uh, 48 Oakland Avenue. Uh, 
first appreciate the patience of the applicants for, for sticking with us. Um, and if you could go ahead and introduce yourselves and uh, tell us what you would like to do. Sure. Um, I'm Lindsay Bronstein and Steve. Steve. Um, and we um, are requesting permission to build um, walls and a roof onto an existing side porch um, that's off of our bedroom. Um, which would violate the half story regulations um, because of actually sort of similar conditions. Um, our, uh, our basement level, uh, the property slopes down the hill um, sort of into the crusher lot. And so it's our basement level is above grade um, in the back and at grade in the front. Um, and so we are requesting a special permit, um, for this, the, um, little additional room off of our bedroom, um, that's the existing porch. And our architect, Catherine McPhail, is here also. Hi. <laughs> Good evening. Um, do you have, uh, something you would like to share? Sure, I, I could share my screen and just review the drawings. Okay, you should be all set to share. Mr. Chairman. Dr. Hanlon? Just for the record, could, could if you're looking for a special permit, I'm guessing that you are currently in, the applicant is, is currently not in compliance with the half story requirement and we're talking about an intensification. Or are we talking about a new nonconformity? We we're not extending the nonconformity here. It's just um, it is built over a a porch. Um, would be built over a porch, which onto the primary bedroom floor, which we would normally consider the second floor, but is actually um, you know the third floor because of the basement situation. And they do have an attic as well that is not um, habitable. So. It appears from the street as if it's a two and a half story house, even with the addition. But because the second story is considered the third third story, it isn't in compliance with the two and a half story rule. I guess my question is, why is it that we're dealing with this as a special permit in this case, rather than the variance that we did in the case just before? Well, I think that's because what's the building, the, the building department felt that it was uh, allowable at first because it was being built on something that was within the existing footprint of the house. And then um, I don't, I don't really know what to say other than, other than that about it being a special permit. Yeah, thank you. So Mr. Hanlon, I believe that the house is already pre-existing non-conformity in regards to the number of stories. Yes, that is true. Okay, so I'll just go through this quickly. Am I sharing this? Yes, screen? you are. I think so. Okay, so uh, this is the existing house and um, this area here is where they would be building onto their main bedroom upstairs. This is a view going driving down Oakland. This is a uh, an image of their lot on the town GIS viewer. And you can see that they, they don't have any neighbor over here. It's just the uh, the middle school and the crusher lot back there. Um, and they are also on a slope. And Oakland, of course, is, goes downhill. And it also falls back into the back of their property. So um, from the front here, you can see that going up the hill, this is their uh, existing garage and an existing family room. And then you can't, it just looks, you can't tell from that it would be a three and a half story building at all from the front. And there's really no view from the back except for from the woods. And this is just uphill from the house as you're as you're driving by this with with leaves. This is with without leaves. So there's uh, the argument there is that it's really not. If the intent of the bylaw is to, um, you know, maintain a certain. Um, density. Then I, I feel like it still looks like a two. It looks like we're adding on to the second story rather than the third story. It's always hard to explain these things. Um, so this is the existing first floor, and this is the uh, the side porch that is an office right now. And then this would be uh, the 
the roof, the existing roof. And then this would be where they're, they're, we, they'd be turning this into kind of a dressing room sort of closet. And it would be a kind of um, matching the windows below. So hopefully it will be in keeping with the, um, the look of the house. And that's, um, yeah, that's, that's it. Okay. Could you go back to that rear elevation? Okay. So it slopes way down over here. And then at this point, this is the garage. And at this point it's, um, it's right on the, the numbers are right on the edge. So it's right. It's within like a percentage or two of, of being a basement. But again, this this view is from you can't nobody's really seeing this because their their lot goes way back. Um, well, anyway, that is what it is mm -hmm. anyway. But uh, their lot goes, you know, far back here, right? And then you know, there's there's so my under my understanding of this, you know, per Mister Hanlon's question. Um, the difference between this case and the previous case, the previous case was currently compliant in regards to building height, both in terms of the, the number of feet and the number of stories. Um, this property has an existing nonconformity in regards to the number of stories. Um, and that yes. is literally has three floors at the moment. Um, and so we are, this is an increase to one of those floor levels, um, but it does not substantially change. Um, it does not create a new nonconformity by its addition. It's only an in intensification of an existing nonconformity. But the house does meet the criteria, does meet the number of the height in feet that is that and that is not being proposed to be changed. Correct. And that is the reason that this, so this is coming before us. This is, so there's two different sections listed on the, on the announcement. Um, and no, it wasn't, but I, I agree with the initial application that it's really, it's a section 813B um, and 813A that, that this deals with. So this is a pre-existing non-conforming condition. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I will share the bylaw. There we go. Uh, so eight one three A that an alteration, reconstruction, extension, or structural change to a single or two family residential structure that is completely within the existing foundation walls does not increase the non-conforming nature of said structure. So this is entirely within those. So as far as the zoning is concerned, it is not does not increase the non-conforming nature. And then B is no alteration, reconstruction, extension, or structural change to a single or two family residential structure that increases the non-conforming nature of said structure shall be permitted unless there's a finding by the Board of Appeals that proposed alteration, reconstruction, extension, or structural change will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, so the two of these read together almost implies that you don't need action from the board because 813A says that um, because you're within the footprint and it's a non-conforming, you're changing a non-conforming nature, but because you're within the footprint, you are the increase does not increase the non-conforming nature. Um, that the the board sees similar cases to this for other reasons, but that. Um, the board often finds that these do not actually require a finding by the board, but in this case, um, uh, you are before us and the board will, will uh, 
we'll proceed and take a look at this. I would note that the um, Department of Planning and Community Development uh, were unable to provide a um, any comment on this uh, particular application um, before the you know uh, before the time of the hearing. So we do not have any um, any written comment from them in this matter. Um, are there questions from the board? Mr. Chair. Mr. Riccadelli. Uh, maybe more of a comment, but I think, uh, you know, the extension of the nonconformity in this case, unlike uh, the previous case we, we heard, uh, makes this much more straightforward. And uh, if the finding that we're making is that it's uh, not more detrimental to the neighborhood, I feel very comfortable. Uh, I think the elevation looks very appropriate, and I, I would support that. Thank you, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon, just subject to being completely turned around, as I nearly was in the last case by the eloquence of both my colleagues and the public. Um, it seems to me that the the last case, which wanted to do something more or less similar, was really really hard. And this one seems to me to be really, really easy. Uh, if this is, in fact, uh, completely within the existing foundation walls, then it doesn't increase the non-conforming nature of the structure. And therefore, it it shouldn't even be what before us. It, it basically uh, shows that they can do it as a matter of right. But if we, for any reason we thought that was not the case, uh, this doesn't seem to be a very difficult case under for a finding of being substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood uh, for reasons Mr. Ricardelli stated and for the various reasons that the applicant's architect has done. So the a decision on this would go in the alternative. It, it either isn't a, a uh, increase in the non-conforming nature of the structure, or if it is, a Section 6 finding is appropriate. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the board before we go for public comment? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. Um, so I agree with both Mr. Hanlon and Mr. Riccardelli. And I do wonder too, I think we discussed this before and we feel like if it makes its way to us, we should probably issue some sort of a decision. On the other hand, it also strikes me that we should be able to send something back to the building department and say, we don't think this needs to be here. And, and I don't want to play hot potato with these things. I get that. But it does seem to me that we're sort of running into this over and over again, where we say, well, you know, it's not uh, increasing the non-conforming nature of the structure, therefore, what are we doing? And so I, I would just like to figure out a way of dealing with this so that A, people don't have to necessarily show up for a meeting with us, but they may not know that they don't have to show up for a meeting with us until they show up. And so that's sort of the difficulty, but I'd, I'd like to explore that a little bit to see if there's some pipeline we could have with the building department. And, you know, and if it turns out that no, people need to come here to get, you know, a stamp from us, then so be it. But it just seems to me that this happens more and more. Okay. I think that's definitely a conversation. Oh, Mr. Hanlon? I just wanted to point out that occasionally, uh, at some of us at least, have been convinced they didn't have to come before us. And then after talking to Mr. Champa, became equally convinced the other way. So it's it's a discussion. Uh, but I, but I, I agree with Mr. Dupont that it's a channel that we should be using and that we have been using in order to try to make sure that everybody, uh, that every, that inspectional services and we are on the same page um, about this thing. I'm not quite. I've never actually seen one that deals with the half story before. Usually, they deal with other issues, but the, in principle, it's the same as other things that we've seen. Thank you. With that, I'm going to go ahead and open the meeting for public comment. Public comment questions are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public, we've granted time to ask their questions and make comments. 
Um, if you would like to speak, please raise your hand using the button on the participant tab or sorry, on the reactions tab. Um, and then uh, Steyer 9, if you are called in. Are there any members of the public who wish to address the board this evening? At this point, I do not actually see any members of the public on the meeting at all. So I will go ahead and close public comment. Okay, so what the board has before it, um, this is a request for a special permit. Um, this is in regards to section 813 in the um, zoning bylaws, which regards non-conforming single family or two family dwellings. Uh, the applicants are requesting to construct a second level on top of a, a single story, um, uh, what's labeled on one plan as a sunroom and on another plan as an office. Um, but it is, nevertheless, it's a condition space. There was a question earlier on about whether it was actually a porch. And if it was a new space over a porch, that would absolutely require a zoning board of appeals to issue a special permit. But that's not the case here. It is condition space. Um, and it is within the existing footprint of the of the foundation wall. And so um, the bylaws state that this is um, something that the board is able to um, consider that this is not a substantial uh, change. It doesn't change the non-conforming nature. Um, but this house it does have a pre-existing non-conformity in regards to the number of floors. Uh, and so what we are requested to do um, in that case is we need to make a determination under section 813B, uh, which is also the same determination that would be under chapter 40A section six, that uh, the proposed alteration um, to an existing non-conforming structure that um, in the text of the finding that we have to find that the increase in the non-conforming nature of the structure will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing condition. Um, I think there have been statements both by the, the owners, the architects, and by several members of the board that uh, this does not appear to um, create any, uh, does not appear to be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing condition. Uh, so with that, are there any additional questions or comments from the board? Do not see any. Um, should the board vote to approve this application? Uh, there are the three standard conditions which were read into the uh, record earlier this evening uh, that the board would attach to the um, to the decision. Are there any additional conditions that the board feels would be required on this application? Seeing none. Um, and there are no further comments. Uh, the board, the chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that the uh, board approve the special permit application subject to the standard conditions that were read into the record in the preceding case. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. This is a roll call vote of the board uh, to approve the special permit for 48 Oakland Avenue with the three standard conditions. Uh, so vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That special permit is approved. Great. Thank you thank all you. very much. Good luck. Thank you. And thank you for your patience as well. Uh, so this brings us to um, the hearing where I just go over this calendar upcoming. Um, so the board has on so Thursday, May 25th at 7.30 p.m. We are going to have an executive session in regards to um, upcoming litigation uh, in regards to a property on Mystic Avenue. You all should have uh, received notice of that. Um, and I apologize to Mr. Riccadelli because I know that he's unavailable, I believe, Thursday at 7 30. Um, but we will make sure that counsel is available to uh, to explain anything to you that he explains to us at the time. Um, so we'll do the executive session um, from 7 30 to 8, and then at 8 a.m., uh, 8 a.m., excuse me, 8 <laughs> p.m. on Thursday. Uh, as a continued deliberations on 1021, 1025, 20, 1027 Massachusetts Avenue. Um, so the updated uh, 
decision as of our last hearing um, that sort of accepted all the changes we made and then put that back out. So everyone should make sure they take a look at it. If there are any outstanding points on that hearing that the board, that members of the board feel are important to include in the decision, um, please go ahead and make note of those. Um, I know I, I have noted a few, I know Mr. Hanlon has as well, um, but if there's anything else that you're feeling a little uncomfortable with or, or things we wanna make sure that we capture um, that, that that is the intent of Thursday. And the, the plan is on Thursday to, to basically complete out the decision, then um, can spend the weekend cleaning it up, making sure it's all nice and clean, make sure everybody has one last chance to look at it. And then uh, Tuesday, May 30th at 7.30, we would have a very short meeting essentially just to pick up any last second corrections and to vote on the decision and then be done um, because we have to be done by, next, by a week from Sunday. So uh, that is those intentions. Um, and then after that, we have a hearing on June 13th at 7.30, which is uh, the continuation of 10 Sunnyside. And then Tuesday, June 20th, uh, we have a regular hearing scheduled. Um, and Colleen, I believe you said there were two cases on for the 20th, is that right? There are two, but there was a third that came in today that I can actually have ready. Um, and that would okay. keep everything too. So we'll say three hearings. Great. So Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I just wanted to avoid stopping before we get to July 11th, but the the hearing that we've tentatively, we've reserved the time on Ju July 11th for the next hearing after the 13th on the 10 Sunnyside case. And it looks to me as if we're going to be using that date. So I'm hoping everybody continues to save it. Great, thank you. Um, I know myself and Mr. Hamlin have, have, have reached out to, to everyone. If you have vacation plans that you know of, just let us know so we can make sure we get it into the records so, um, so that we know who's available when and we're not scheduling hearings when people aren't available. So um, if you haven't had an opportunity to send those in, please go ahead and do so. And with that, <clears throat> I would like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I would especially like to thank Colleen Ralston and Marissa Lau for their assistance in preparing for and hosting our online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. It is our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming, let's say, weeks. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So moved. Thank Second. You. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the board to adjourn for the evening, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very, very much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.